Okay, class, so now we resume with uh, the second half of Cubism for today. Um, so this is based on the 1912 chapter, which uh, is the most difficult chapter, uh, probably all semester long. I got myself a little coffee. Pardon the sipping. Uh, my microphone seems to pick up everything, so um, uh, I apologize. Um, so synthetic Cubism. Uh, around the time of 1912, you started to get this radical change in um, in the way Brock, Brock first actually, and Picasso uh, conceived their Cubist practice. So they started moving away from the analytic work that we just saw, which is almost obscure, um, very difficult to decipher work. This is one of the ironies of that that initial interpretation of cubism that it's giving you more information about the world multiple perspectives because actually you can't make the world out for the most part it's just a, a jumbled mess to our eyes um, so maybe that just reinforces the fact that we're not fit to we're not we're not creatures fit to, to be able to see more than one moment of time at once uh, but whatever the case might be Brock and Picasso around 1912 started to shift away from that and the big departure and the, the feature that some art historians say make this the most revolutionary break of painterly practice, of art practice uh, in, in, in history um, for painting is the inclusion of papier coulis. Um, and this is the invention of collage. So where, whereas um, um, Picasso, in his still life with chair caning, introduced these non on objects. It's George Brock who introduces um, wallpaper um, and pasted paper, things like newspaper, onto the surface of the canvas as a pictorial element, as a feature of the painting for the first time. And so this is where we get the term synthetic cubism. Uh, they're synthesizing painting with uh, the, rest of, the rest of the world, things that are, that are outside of, of painting. And these then get much lighter. I don't know about you, but when you look at this Brock fruit dish in glass, it's much more light. Li um, it's much lighter, more diaphanous. You can sort of understand um, some of the the elements in the work, um, and you're still getting this this tension between flatness and recession and space. But now he's doing it with this fake. Um, in part, he's doing it with this fake wood grain wallpaper that he's included as a, as an element in his in his in his uh, in his work. So this is the first time Brock is the the one who more or less invents papier coulis, uh, making him important for the history of collage. A uh, collage in French means to uh, to glue. Papier coulis means uh, to paste uh, paste paper. Um, and so Picasso would follow suit. So. Uh, you would have much more, at least visually simplified, uh, works. And in some cases, this is not really even painting anymore, right? You have the top of a journal, um, of a newspaper, le journal again. You have colored paper, uh, kind of this dark black paper, and then this blue paper here, white cutout paper, fake wood grain, a musical score, and then a discarded, like a drawing or a sketch, that uh, Picasso would have maybe done before, that he then just includes in this work. And then the background, if we can speak of it as background, because part of it is not background. Uh, this part is actually part of the guitar, right? This is like a, a guitar with a sheet music and the glass here. The background is, is this wallpaper. Um, and so we, in, in some sense, we've actually even moved away from painting altogether, uh, which is what collage is, right? Using these disparate cutout elements. Uh, to make a picture. So quite a revolutionary step um, in, in Western pictorial language through this moment in, um, in, in, in synthetic cubism. And like analytic cubism, this just there's just an explosion of discourse over these works, what they mean, uh, what they mean for the history of art, what Picasso and Brock may be meant by them, um, how do we interpret them, and so on and so forth. So again, this is like a whole minefield of interpretations uh, that we want to that we want to go through. Uh, so these papier collés, some will say that they're influenced by Apollinaire. He comes back, this really important uh, French poet of the early 20th century, and very close friend of Picasso. 
he's one of the first poets to start introducing very uh, contemporary, at least for the time, uh, language, sounds, images uh, from everyday life into his poems. Right. So before before this poetry, someone like Malarmé, who's talked about quite a bit in this chapter, uh, still had a conception of poetry as this refined, rarefied place of creativity um, that's separate from like the everyday language of newspaper and business and popular culture and entertainment. Right. Um, with Apollinaire, it's as if he, he started to see the world as this place that he could use in his poems. And he says, right here, he embraced the shock of the new handbills, catalogs, posters, sounds that he hear, that he hears outside, um, tabloids, police reports, all this stuff. Like so, this very ephemeral, which means it doesn't last very long. These are things that just uh, they come and go, um, and these things from everyday life. These became the the, the contents of his of his poetry in Alcul. And so some argue uh, that, like Apollinaire, Picasso and Braque were influenced to do the same thing, not through language and poetry, but through the actual physical things that they're seeing around them. The ephemeral, again, handbills, posters, catalogs, newspapers, wallpaper, all this stuff. It's as if they also took all that to then make art, to, 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 um, to come up with a new representational language, one that fits well with this new world all around them. So that's an interesting interpretation. Um, others claim that uh, these papiers collés, the newspapers especially that were chosen for um, for the works, they were actually political. That especially Picasso, uh, because a lot of scholars have noticed that on these papiers collés, um, I can go back to this one. This one has la la bataille s'est s'est engagée, which means the, the 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 war started or the the, the battle started. And that's just one instance of many um, where, <clears throat> excuse me, where Picasso cut out a newspaper, not, they argue, willy-nilly, but it, they had certain uh, stories and headlines that had to do with the Balkan Wars that were uh, underway in 1912 and 1913, which catastrophically will lead us to World War I. So Europe could feel this coming, um, this insane First World War. They could feel it coming, so it was in the, in the news quite a bit. Uh, and so Picasso, maybe as a way to be politically engaged, included specifically news stories or news headlines that had to do with the politics of his time, the geopolitics of the time of the Balkan Wars. So that's an interesting interpretation. Um, there are some that argue along this, this vein that Picasso, yes, maybe he was engaged, but he was also in some ways critiquing the newspapers um, and maybe like the neutrality of newspapers that if you cut them out and crop them and show them in a different light that maybe you start to realize oh this th this th this comes from a, a specific vantage point there's a certain ideology at play here um, this is not let's say objective news but um, this is some sort of subjective take on, on, on the world um, so I don't know how convinced you are by those type of interpretations, but certainly within the Picasso literature of these papiers collés, some have argued that he's in some ways commenting about the news, the media of his time, and also the geopolitical uh, goings-on of the, of the Balkan Wars and the upcoming um, First World War. Others have argued, and I find this, this interpretation kind of nice, um, mainly because it's kind of this working class interpretation of these works, is that what, what Picasso and, and Brock with these papier collés, what they're referencing is in fact cafe culture of the time. And so this is a really famous pa papier collé. It's really a lovely papier collé. Uh, it's called Glass and Bottle of Suze. Suze is a, is a well-known aperitif in France. It, it's very yellow. Um, it's something you drink before, before dinner. Uh, and it tastes a little like dandelion. Um, very popular drink. I, not not here, but um, it's a very popular drink. So you have a bottle of Suze in the middle here. Like the still the the the, the still life with chair and caning, you're getting the bottle and the glass from profile, but then you're getting the table from as if you're sitting at it, looking down. 
Right? So these, the, both both the visual and the seated, the embodied, um, seems to be represented in this um, <clears throat> in this papier collé. And then, of course, notice that the whole thing is made up of newspapers. And so some scholars have argued not only is Picasso picking certain news stories to embed in his works so that those that news information somehow <clears throat> gets out. Um, this is one of the maybe one of the weaknesses of this of this type of interpretation because I can't imagine people looking at um, Picasso's papier collier around this time would have not have been the, the like the choir um, uh, when it comes to his politics, but maybe not. We'd have to do more research on that. Whatever the case may be, what we do know is that while today what we do, um, hopefully all of us, what we do is we sort of, at some point in the day, we log into our computers and we read the news. We read about the, these protests, we read about all these incredible things that hopefully are underway in this country and around the world when it has to do with issues of, of uh, race and anti-racism. Um, um, and police brutality, and so on and so, so forth. So we read, uh, we read the news, and it's right there. It's available to us. Like there's the Guardian, there's the New York Times, there's the the City, uh, there's the Gothamist. Like these are they're all there for us to, to read. You can watch Democracy Now and get an hour of like the news of the world, um, which is an important part of being you know a citizen um, and a fully formed person, knowing knowing what's going on. But in 1912. This was not something you could do, right? And in fact, if you were poor, more working class, it's very likely you wouldn't even have been able to afford a subscription to Journal or Le Figaro or um, or uh, whatever other newspaper that you would that you would have wanted to, to read. And so, what people would do, especially workers, they would go to cafes, and the cafe would have one newspaper, and they would all share it. And then they would discuss politics, and they would discuss everyday life, and they would discuss social issues um, at the cafe, which is why when you go to France, uh, you'll notice there's a rich, rich cafe life there where everybody's talking, and there's, there's, there's quite a bit of public discourse happening in those spaces. Uh, we have that here too, um, a little bit, but it's definitely, it seems to be much more pronounced in Europe, um, and especially in, in France and Paris. And so the way then these papier, uh, these, these papier collier are interpreted along these lines is to say that actually Picasso is referencing this milieu, this social life of what the cafes were like, of working class, uh, poor people coming there to read the news. You almost become that person by looking at these papier collier because you're, the, you're at the cafe table and you can look up close and read and read the news. So that's, that's an interpretation that's kind of interesting and fun. But the, the interpretation of these works that have really, in, in, for the most part, stuck, um, and the ones that, it's, oddly enough, they're very theoretical. Picasso and Brock were not theory-driven guys. Uh, they were much more, let's say, intuitive um, um, artists. But the, the, it is, there are ways in which what, the way they spoke actually does fit with this far more theoretical interpretation of these works. Uh, which is to say that rather than these works sort of representing the world in some way that actually is kind of traditional, right? Uh, this is representing cafe culture by using the, the very medium of the cafe culture. It's almost like representing it directly. Um, it's the same thing with, with um, the Apollinaire interpretation of these paintings, that if it's giving you the politics up front through the newspapers, then it's basically just representing the politics. It's almost uh, traditional. But a number of, of um, scholars have said that actually what Picasso and Brock were doing with these papier collier was less about politics, was less about everyday life. It was much more about radically breaking with what we even understanding uh, representation and painting to be. So painting since the Renaissance, and uh, even before that, but we're just sticking with the history of the Renaissance up to the early 20th century. Painting in almost every situation has always been within the realm of the iconic. Iconic is a tricky word. We use the word iconic like, you know, Michael Jordan or LeBron James, they're iconic ba basketball players, right? Um, that's the more everyday understanding of the word iconic or Leo Messi, iconic um, soccer player. That's not quite the way in which linguists use this term. So it's important to sort of give yourself another definition of it. An iconic sign, 
um, is an image that serves to resemble the world. So in some cases, in some ways, iconic means the same thing as mimetic or mimesis. It's an image that looks like the world. So we're going to get to this in a second, but this is, you know, this is a tree, right? Um, this almost can be like um, an emoji for a tree. An emoji is an icon. It's an image or a sign, an image sign that represents something in the world by looking like that thing that's in the world. So think about it. Everything from early Renaissance all the way up to um, even the Vienna Secessionism that we started with in this class, it's all in the iconic mode. You're getting a painting, an image that looks like something in the world. But that's not how language works. That's how visual language has worked. But that's not how the language I'm using right now works, for the most part. The way I talk, and the way we text, and the way we speak, and the way we write, um, whatever language it might be, I'm using English right now, um, I've spoken some French words in this lecture, uh, you might speak another language, whatever it might be, those words are not iconic, they're symbolic. And a word in, 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 um, in the structure of a language is a sign that does not resemble the world, and it, but it does stand in for it. So it doesn't look like the thing in the world, but it does stand in for it. So um, unlike the tree that looks like the tree, the word arbor or tree or arbre in French or whatever language, um, whatever other language, we'll stick with tree, that will be easiest, right? Um, the word tree and the letters T-R-E-E -E do not in any way resemble that bark, leaf, leafy, beautiful thing that's emitting, that's taking in CO2 and omitting O2, right? Uh, there's no necessary relationship between the word tree and that thing in the world that you can see, hopefully, if you're looking out your window um, right now. So that's the way the symbolic world, that's the way language works. Language does not look like the thing it stands in for. Um, and then, so this begs the question, how in the world do we know that tree represents tree, that the word tree represents um, that thing in the world, or a dog, right? Or my cat just came in and interrupted us um, a little while back. But C-A-T has nothing to do with the creature that, uh, that just walked by and gave a little meow, right? Um, so you had, for the first time in the early 20th century, you had thinkers who were trying to like figure out, well, okay, how does language work then? Um, before this, there was more or less a theological understanding of language that basically, uh, just like an apple on a tree, the word tree is God-given, there it is, we plucked it, we have it, and uh, it's secure, right? That's how it is. Meaning is given by God, right? It's theologically ordained in some ways. But for someone who's, who's secular, who comes out of the Enlightenment, um, who's, who wants to reason through um, how language works and not simply take recourse to a, a divine argument, um, which can't be proven, things get much, much more complex, much, much trickier, right? Uh, because then we have to explain, well, how does, how do these signs work if there is no necessary connection between them? So this is where we get to maybe the trickiest part of, of the whole semester and of this chapter is where we then get to de Saussure, uh, um, Ferdinand de Saussure and his linguistics. So he's the first to start to realize and, and articulate and theorize how language works um, in a scientific way. So one of the first things he says is that uh, the, the signifier that we use, the word, in this case tree or dog, but it could be anything, it, there's an arbitrary relationship. It's an arbitrary thing. Um, it's only through custom where it really sticks. Um, and in, in, in some cases, it could actually, we could actually decide on a different word. If overnight everyone decided, no, actually dog represents that feline creature and cat represents that canine creature, it would work. Everybody would be using and flipping it and oh, slowly over time, the, the meaning of the word would change. So this sounds bizarre, but de Saussure says that that language, the connection, is, is arbitrary. There's no necessary connection between tree and the thing tree, or cat and the thing cat. Uh, well, not thing cat, the, the, the creature, the creature cat. Um, so that's the first step. The second step, and this is the hardest part to understand, um, this is the hardest part to get around. The way in which it works 
within the system of language is differential. A dog only points to dog because every other word in that language, cat, tree, mug, microphone, computer, every single word in that language does not point to that creature cat. So meaning, the way language works, it works through um, a negative relationship with all the other terms in, um, in the system. This is very hard. This is very hard to understand. And it's actually easier to understand through visual uh, examples. So chess is a good one. Uh, here's a chess board. If anybody plays chess, uh, I'm terrible at it, but uh, chess, is, chess is, um, uh, is great fun. Uh, you could, this shows the arbitrariness of language. Because notice, all these pieces are not actual traditional chess pieces. They're all like appliances and furniture. But you can play chess. Right? You can every, you can just decide, oh yeah, pawns are now chairs, or pawns are buckets or whatever, and then a king is a fridge and a queen is a cupboard or whatever. Right? It doesn't, it doesn't matter what they are. But if both players agree that that's what they are, then they can use them. They can function um, as king, queen, pawn, bishop, knight, uh, rook, and so on and so forth. Right? So this shows that the, the sign is arbitrary doesn't matter what the sign is, as long as it's agreed upon, you can use it that way. And then that second step, um, if, if uh, the, let's say, what is this, like a piano or, um, well, it's easier, let's say, let's say this lampshade here is a knight. Um, it's a knight, and it moves this way, you know how knights move if you, if you play chess. It's a knight because, only because every single other piece on this, uh, on this uh, table, except for the other lamp, is not a knight. It only works differentially. It only works in relation, in negative relationship which every, with everything else in the system. So I hope that makes, that makes some sense. Dog, tree, only designates that thing in the world because every single other uh, word in the structure of our language does not point to it. It's almost like you're weeding out all the things that are not pointing to it to get to the thing that is pointing to it. So that's how Saussure um, articulates and theorizes language in, in a first. Like, this is amazing, right? He's trying to scientifically, philosophically understand how language functions a, a, within a scientific way, within a, within a structure, a structural way. And so this might seem completely... Uh, even talking about this feels so arcane with everything else that's happening in the world. Um, but it, it it might actually even be easier um, to elucidate this point through Picasso's work. And this is where these arguments maybe are compelling, because while Picasso didn't even know Saussure, he's, a, he's in Switzerland teaching, um, his stuff isn't even published a decade later, and he didn't know anything about linguistics, modern linguistics, as it was being formalized at this time. There is... In spite of all that, there is a way in which his paintings already show how language works. It's quite amazing. So um, the way in which you can, you can see how this works is that he, he'll use newspaper clippings from the same newspaper. Like, you can tell where this newspaper came from. If you just rotated this one, you could attach it back onto, onto here. Or actually, you'd have to, like, flip it right but it would match up with this one so you know these are cut from the exact same newspaper page but you read this one as background material within this picture and you read this one as coming forward and part of the guitar so even though they're the same thing they're representing two different things in the painting it's weird it's almost like a word um, I don't know, I think Guardian of the Galaxy, Groot. Uh, you, you, if, if you only ever use the word Groot, it will be hard to understand what in the world you're saying. If you use Groot for everything that you see, every, every concept or thing that you know, no one will understand you. They'll just hear Groot. You need to have another word um, uh, that's not Groot to be able to start producing meaning of some kind, right? So here you have, in some ways, the same thing, where these are the same uh, these are cut from the same newspaper, but because you have this um, slight difference, this negation and relationship between the violin and the background, they read as two different signs. So they don't look like a violin, and they don't really look like a background, 
but because of every other um, component within the within the plane of the picture, they do read like that. So it's as if they're representing the world in a symbolic way and not in an iconic way. They're not. They don't look like the world. They're almost like using newspaper to speak the world in the same way that language does. Um, this is why these works are read as so revolutionary. It's breaking with the whole idea of painting as representation through the iconic, uh, through looking like, right? So we can, uh, we, can, we can see this even more clearly when we look at it in separate, right? So if I would have shown you this first, you would have said, I have no idea what that is. It's just like some, some sort of weird geometric shapes uh, on some cutout of a newspaper, but it wouldn't look like anything to you. Right, um, and it's the same thing with this. You would have just said, "Oh, this is a cutout newspaper," but it doesn't seem to be representing anything. Um, but if you put them together, the difference between the two, um, along with, of course, the, the the drawing that connects them, then they start to read uh, as as representative of something, namely the background, and then violin, and they only do so. When by negating each other, because notice if they're if they don't have the other the other side to negate to negate, um, just like language um, functions according to a structuralist, then there's no meaning. Then you don't see it. But if you have it all together, if you see the whole structure of the symbolic system, then they start to read and they produce meaning. But again, the crucial thing here is that they don't produce it um, in an iconic way. They don't. They clearly don't look like the world. If they did look like the world, then independently, as an independent object, you'd be able to know what it is, even without the rest of the system. But because their meaning depends on the rest of the of the system of the papier collé of Picasso's work, then you know that they're working within more of a symbolic uh, realm, and it's arbitrary. And this arbitrariness is in f further enforced by the fact that. It's the same damn thing. It's it's the same damn thing. It's uh, it's a newspaper, the same page, but they're read differently. Um, so this is painting that works more like language. That's the that's the the main takeaway of this type of interpretation. And what's interesting is that this is where we finish. What's interesting about this is that it's very likely that Picasso arrived at this and Brock they arrived at this not because they're reading Saussure they couldn't they couldn't have read him um, not really because of knowing linguistics but because of their interest in African visual culture and here is where we get to a, a maybe it's still a, a form of appropriation um, of um, of a non-western uh, mask and a non-western culture but it's a much more sophisticated one one that gives a lot more credit to that other culture. This is no longer the mask as just some kind of like weapon um, that looks scary, right? This sort of um, almost childish understanding of masks that Picasso has in the Demoiselle. Now, this exposure to non-Western visual culture, non-Western art that Picasso especially is, 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 um, is um, interested in at this time, comes across through a much more um, refined and and um, and philosophical and structural way. So there's a there's a way in which already the insights that we're saying are so great about these papiers that they're showing you how language works that they're within a symbolic uh, mode of representation. It's something African art already knew. They already knew that you could use arbitrary shapes um, in order to. Uh, convey the world in some ways. So these masks with these very simplified, uh, very geometric uh, shapes that independently would not read as having any meaning other than let's say a circle or a square um, or certain like triangular patterns, but put together in the structural unity of this mask, this Gribo mask that a lot of scholars argue was the mask that Picasso was influenced by most. If they're put together within a sign system, these then read as eyes, this reads as a nose, this reads as a mouth, this reads as hair, uh, this reads as like a helmet or something like that, right? Uh, so it's already as if African visual culture, African art, knew these things about the way language works in structural terms, in, uh, in differential negative terms, um, that then is ciphered through this uh, this synthetic stage of, of cubism 
So it's still a way of appropriating uh, uh, a non-Western culture, but it's one that maybe gives that culture more its due um, as having come to a, an important insight about the way we understand meaning, the way we have language, the way we, we uh, construct the world symbolically, um, as having gotten to that insight before uh, Cubism. So that's an interesting way. An interesting way to, to, to talk about the influence is more than simply this subordinate scary thing, right? That influences the the brilliant uh, Picasso. Um, it's a it's a much more um, symmetrical reading of, of the influence. Okay, everybody. So, like I said, this is the this is the hardest chapter. Uh, I tried to make it as uh, understandable. For you, uh, when we get to structuralist linguistics, it's it's hard to do, especially not in person. Uh, these recorded lectures are, in fact, uh, still somewhat new to me. It's much easier to explain these things in person, where you're asking me questions, and I'm further refining the way I'm explaining it to you. But my hope is that this uh, this second session uh, will help you make a bit more sense of these these big ideas that come out of this really really massive archive of cubist. Um, of the cube of the scholarship on cubism so so that's it for today's session uh, that's more than enough uh and i'll see you um, or you'll hear from me uh, with the next one take care everybody bye bye